<laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Phil McNichols. As uh, Linda Lee mentioned, I'm the um, Conservation Committee Chair. And, um, I, you know, I, I just got uh, involved in this just a, oh, about six months ago with the Opinion J project. And in that process, we were going through uh, and working with the Great Basin Bird Observatory. And in my research uh, and calling around the state, uh, I ran into Amy and Lisa Rossi, who were doing a research already on the Pinion Jay for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So it was in, it, they had a good thought and I agree with it is that this would be great to have them present what they've been doing in the past uh, and right now and how, um, how their research is going and how we can also help them in the process. So it's really um, kind of fortuitous. Uh, and so this will be recorded uh, as, as Linda mentioned. I also wanna say thank you all for coming online. This is really great because, you know, at the end of the day, particularly with, um, with community science projects and with um, all of you going out to the field, really the people out in the field day to day are really, they're the, the eyes and ears and uh, the, <laughs> binoculars on the situation. So they have a re you have a really good feel for what's going on out there. So I just wanted to say thank you all for, for coming on um, and having interest in this project. I'm hoping to learn, a, uh, I'm expecting to learn, I, I expect to learn a lot tonight and I'm hoping you all do also. Amy received her undergraduate degree from Washington and her master's degree from Humboldt State University. And a lot of this is in their bio. And I think the, the most important part is that she spent 16 years working in, as, and is working as the species conservation coordinator right now. Um, and has done a lot of work with uh, different species, the pika, the gunnison and white-tailed prairie dogs and southern ptarmigan, um, rosy finches and pinion jays. So she's very well positioned uh, in the field and um, understands the environment. She's located in Montrose. Um, so she's, she's kind of right in the Pinion J area. Uh, Lisa has also worked with uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife for, I believe, 20 years now, which is, is, is good. It's good to have that kind of experience. And started her career as an area biologist in Rural County and Jackson Counties. So she's got really good experience in the Colorado area. And um, in 2016, she took over a position as a statewide bird conservation coordinator, and now leads many of the avian species projects, um, which is great. She's also on the Pinion J working group. And I don't know if you'll mention anything about that um, in the process. Okay, she's shaking her head. Um, because that's a group that has been working on Pinion Jays for, um, she'll tell you how long, but I would guess for several years now. Um, and so, uh, I'm just hoping, I, I'm expecting I'll learn a lot tonight and I'm gonna turn this over to Lisa with hopes that Amy can join us uh, in the short term. So here you go, Lisa. Okay, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I actually go by Liza, Liza. <laughs> that's, okay. A, that's okay. Um, anyway, it looks like we have a great turnout tonight and that's really exciting exciting. So thank you all for joining. Um, and we are having a little bit of technical dif difficulties, but hopefully we'll figure that out and Amy will be able to join in a little in a little bit. I'll see if I can share the presentation. You guys see the slideshow? I do. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, like um, Philip said, Amy and I were gonna talk about pinion jays and some of the work we're doing with Colorado Parks and Wildlife in Colorado. Um, and uh, hopefully Amy will join. If not, you'll be hearing from me tonight. 
So first, we wanted to just start out by talking about some of the really amazing and fascinating aspects of Pinion J life history. Um, <clears throat> they are a member of the Crow family and uh, Corvid family, and many of you probably know this, um, but they're really intelligent and clever birds, um, highly social with a complex vocal communication. And in Colorado, um, the more work we do with them, we find out they really are a resident of the pinyon juniper woodland. We do know that in other parts of the range, they can use ponderosa pine and limber pine and probably in some parts of Colorado, but in our surveys, we just have not um, been finding them in these, in these areas. And, and then, like I said, they're highly social and they spend their life in flocks. Um, most flocks are 50 to 100 birds. But actually, Amy and I were lucky enough to be able to count a flock of 800 birds <clears throat> a couple of years ago uh, near Montrose. So that was pretty amazing just to watch uh, this giant flock um, flying over our heads. And so they have, they've co-evolved with the pinyon pine tree. Um, and so because of that, or as part of, you know, co-evolution, they have unique morphological and behavioral adapt adaptations. So, and some, you know, um, they, they have an expandable esophagus that can hold up to 52 pinion pine nuts that they then will transport to, to cache the nuts. And they also have an exceptional spatial memory so that once they cache the pinion nuts, then they can go back <clears throat> and find those. And they have large pointed bills for opening the cones and then naked nostrils. So they are unique and um, in their ability to collect and cache pinion nuts. And then likewise, the pinion pine has co-evolved <laughs> with the pinion jay. So they have large wingless seeds that require uh, dispersal by animals. The seeds are highly nutritional. Um, I think we all appreciate pinion pine. <laughs> nuts. The, the cones take about three years to mature. Uh, they do open upwards for easy access um, and for bird, you know, dispersal. They do create, have abundant seeds during mast years. Um, and the trees produce mast crops about every seven to 10 years. So it is um, a little bit hit or miss at points. So um, it, individual jays can cache more than 20,000 seeds in a single season. And because of that exceptional spatial memory, they can recover you know, up to 90 or 95% of those seeds. And then the remaining 5% are able to germinate. And that's how you get um, you know, pinion forests coming back after disturbance or fires or something like that. Um, and then um, in terms of the mutualistic relationship, they also have long distance dispersal um, of the millions of seeds. And they've found, um, researchers have found seeds up to 12 kilometers um, to a cache. And they often will cache seeds out in open sites. So that lower, the lower picture, well, both pictures, you can see that they're really out in kind of grassy areas, not in a dense pinion pine forest or pinyon juniper forest. Um, and then they cache, the, the cache sites are, are microhabitats that are open and often favorable for germination. So they can help replant a woodland, um, like I just mentioned um, in the previous slide. So this slide just kind of gives you an idea of the annual um, behaviors of the pinyon jay. So in the fall, the pinyon co cones will begin to ripen and then pinion jays will be spending every day collecting the pinion nuts or other foods for caching. And then in the winter, the seed crop becomes depleted and the juveniles will disperse and the flock actually at this point will roam widely to find seed sources. And then when um, seed sources are scarce, they actually will go really, um, really far to find sources. That's when you'll see them at bird feeders. Uh, last winter, we actually had two winters ago, we had them up in Steamboat Springs. We're way out of their range. Um, and, and then in the spring, uh, they'll go back to their colony sites. And this is where then they will stay really close to these areas and the breeding begins. 
And we'll talk about breeding a lot more later in the presentation. And then in the summer, um, they'll splinter into the flock, flocks um, and into kind of independent feeding aggregations. And um, they'll roam around in the home range. They have really large home ranges. And then um, the annual molt will signal the end of the breeding season. So um, in terms of breeding, and this is really what we're gonna focus on tonight, and that's where CBW has done a lot of our work, um, but it's one of our earliest nesting passerines. They do nest in a colony, but this is really kind of a loose aggregation of nests. It's not what we sometimes think of as kind of colonial nesting birds. Um, that some of the nests are you know, up to a kilometer away, and we still consider, consider that a nesting colony. Uh, pairs are monogamous and are thought to mate for life. And then younger birds um, help out with the family group and they can guard and feed the fledglings and make a lot of noise when intruders enter the colony. So courtship behaviors begin early. And like I said, this is one of the earliest breeding <clears throat> of our birds. And courtship behaviors actually begin in mid-February um, to early March. Amy likes to say that they generally start around February 14th and they like Valentine's Day. <laughs> so um, they really do start quite early when we are still kind of in the midst of winter. Um, the male and females will build the nest with the female finishing the interior. And then because it is often so cold during this period, the nest is insulated against the cold. Um, and we'll be talking about nests a little bit later as well, but you can see there's grasses and then juniper bark. There's lots of things lining this nest. Uh, they generally lay between two and five eggs. It seems like from our work, it's commonly four. And they'll produce one brood, although they may re-nest if the first nest fails. And we've definitely had some re-nesting birds in some of our colonies. So the female incubates the eggs for about 17 days and the male will feed her during the nest incubation. Um, and then she'll also brood them for about eight to 10 days, after which point both the male and female will feed the, feed the nestlings. And then they will fledge at about 22 to 24 days. And then really soon after fledging, like within a couple, a day or two, they will leave the colony area and, <clears throat> and go into kind of the surrounding habitat. Um, and at this point, then the fledglings are fed by the parents and the yearlings um, and the rest of their, their group. Whoops, sorry, backwards. So that's kind of the really fun and interesting stuff, um, some of the ecology of pinion jays. And now I was going to talk a little bit about kind of the conservation concern and how CPW got involved with the, some of our pinion jay work about five years ago. So as I think most of you are probably aware on this, on this um, presentation, there is a, you know, kind of broad concern about pinion jays in large part because of a pretty steep decline um, from 1968 to 2015. And the, these data are estimates from BVS routes, but the overall population loss is, you know, over 80%, which actually exceeds that of greater sage grouse. So it is a, it's quite a steep decline, um, but we really don't know much about the pinion jay, uh, about the reasons for this decline. Um, and so some of the work that um, CPW is trying to do, but also partners on the pinion jay working group are trying to figure out what, why do we have, what are the mechanisms and why are we having this kind of decline? And then there has been a <clears throat> petition submitted to list, lease the species under the Endangered Species Act. So this table just kind of shows, you know, that we have declines kind of range wide. Some areas are steeper declines than others. All of the um, number, the estimates in red are those <clears throat> where we're fairly confident in the in the declines, where the you know the confidence intervals do not cross zero. But you can see that, you know, for Colorado, uh, it's negative as well as Montana, you know, lots of the states and many of these states, the ones with the asterisks over here, 
actually all these states, including Colorado, include the pinyon jay as a species of greatest conservation need in the State Wildlife Action Plan. So the states are have been recognizing the importance of pinyon jays as well. And then just digging a little bit into some of the data we have for Colorado, uh, we looked at the um, IMBCR <clears throat> data, so Integrated Monitoring and Bird Conservation Regions, uh, which we have statewide coverage in Colorado since 2009. So we actually are getting to a point where we're getting some pretty good trends. And the good news is that the IMBCR data do not show you know, as steep a decline, at least from 2009 to 2021. Uh, it actually looks like they might be pretty stable in Colorado, which is which is great news. Um, and on the BLM, Colorado BLM lands, also pretty stable to potentially increasing um, region two of the Forest Service, which includes most of the forests in Colorado as well as some out of the state, uh, also um, potentially you know slightly increasing, but really pretty stable. We, we're not seeing steep declines, at least in the recent past in Colorado with IMBCR data. So as I mentioned, there has been broad conservation concern for the pinyon jay. Uh, in 2016, it was added to the partners in flight as a yellow lift species with an estimated population half life of 19 years. Uh, it is a species of greatest conservation need in seven states, uh, including Colorado. Uh, the road to recovery, uh, which, which kind of came about after the three billion birds paper, has listed it as a very high urgency species um, because of the really large population loss and continued or accelerated decline. The Fish and Wildlife Service uh, designated the pinyon jay as a birds of conservation, 2021 birds of conservation concern list. And then in 2022, it was uh, included in this, as a tipping point species in the state of the birds. Um, and like I said, in April, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service did receive a petition to list the, list the species. So why are pinyon jays declining? Well, like I said, we really don't know. Um, and that's, um, I guess, what, what we're all trying to figure out. But, you know, we, we do know that pinyon juniper forests have been managed for decades, and there are multiple objectives for woodland management. You know, some of the uh, habitat treatments are done to benefit sage grouse. Sometimes they're done to benefit big grain, big game. Um, in Colorado, especially recently, we've had massive fires, and in many other states as well. But they're you know managed for fuels reduction, especially in areas next to residential areas. Um, they can also be managed to try and provide forage production for livestock. And then also this kind of broad ecosystem restoration of, you know, trying to set back succession. The idea that, you know, we, you know, some researchers think that pinion juniper forests uh, used to have a lot more disturbance than they did, than they do now. And so it's going to take sometimes mechanical or prescribed burning to set back um, the forest to early, early successional stage. Another um, reason for concern is climate change. And as you, as you know, in Colorado, we have been having some long-term drought um, and this can lead to insect outbreaks, um, which we've actually had some pretty large die-offs of pinyon, <clears throat> pinyon pine, especially in the Southwest part of the state. And that can also lead to, drought can also lead to loss of mass crops. And if we don't have a good mass crop, pinyon jays may, um, may not breed at all for that year. And then another you know, changing aspect of <clears throat> on the landscape are changing predator communities where we have additional predators near human, <clears throat> human areas. Um, and really we don't know like what the mechanism is for the pinyon jay decline. Um, so there's a lot of more work, to, a lot more work to be done. So the Pinion Jay Working Group, um, it formed in 2017, and it was really to, you know, the objective was to develop and share the best available science uh, to better understand, conserve, and manage Pinion Jays in their habitat. And it started as a fairly small group at that point, but now I think there's probably over 80 
um, individuals representing the Fish and Wildlife Service, state agencies um, from all the states that have pinion jays pretty much, NGOs like Great Basin Bird Observatory, federal agencies, the BLM and the <clears throat> uh, US Forest Service. And then we've got researchers as well. So there's, there's a whole variety of interested parties uh, working on the pinion, pinion J working group um, currently. Scott Summershoe with um, Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Birds kind of started this up and he's still kind of leading, leading, work, leading the working group, which now does have a steering committee. And we do have, um, we're providing, trying to develop and provide resources that are available at the Partners in Flight um, webpage. And so there's a conservation plan that is there now that talks about some of the research needs and, and habitat management. And then also there are some rec recommendations for a survey protocol as well for researchers who are trying to um, do some work uh, in pinion jay habitat. Uh, and and um, when we started, when CPW started after the working group, there really wasn't a, uh, any kind of protocol to survey for pinion jays. So in 2018, we <clears throat> uh, worked with Utah Division of Wild Wildlife Resources uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, Scott Summershoe, uh, to kind of develop and then conduct standardized surveys across Colorado and in Utah. Um, we did, uh, the 2018 was kind of a pilot year and then we two, did two additional years uh, in 2019 and 2021. Um, and in Colorado, Biologic uh, conducted the Colorado surveys and they did an, aw an awesome job and we all learned so much um, from those surveys. Our funding came from CPW as well as some BLM funding. In Utah, uh, Utah Vision Wildlife Resources did, did their surveys, and that was mostly uh, funded by Fish and Wildlife Service, a Fish and Wildlife Service grant. Uh, but we kind of worked jointly to conduct the same surveys, and we started with really large grids and just trying to detect, detect pinion jays, um, and then from detections, trying to uh, locate colonies. Our effort really was at um, locating col breeding colonies because we, we really didn't know where they were in Colorado or, or in Utah. So with this, we developed, um, we, found, we located a lot of colonies and then, um, and this is what Amy, who's hopefully gonna be on, but beginning in 2020 and 2021, um, she started doing some intensive surveys at 23 of the breeding sites that we have located, some of which are around Montrose, but some of which are in San Luis Valley, up by Range, Rangeley and Meeker. Um, so kind of across, all across Colorado. And we've also developed a survey protocol that we have uh, trained and, and done trainings for the BLM and for the US <clears throat> Forest Service to, for their biologists and fuels managers to be able to locate pinion colonies, pinion jay colonies, um, in order to kind of avoid treating these areas or to even design treatments that could be beneficial. Um, so we really have taken the work that we did starting in 2018 and everything we've learned, and we're really trying to apply it to conservation on the ground here in Colorado. Lisa, Amy said that she was online quite a while ago with the updated presentation. She, okay. she put that in the chat. Okay. So I well, think this is Liza's last slide. And then if we could switch yeah. the presentation, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I can't see the chat. So anyway, this is the last slide of this part of the talk anyway, which is perfect. Uh, so this does show the grids that we surveyed across Colorado that Biologic surveyed. And um, the yellow ones are the ones where pinion jays were detected, but we could not confirm it colony and the red ones, you can see we um, detected colonies. So we did find them kind of broadly across Colorado. And now I'll stop sharing and Amy can share hers. Okay, let me figure this out real quick. Thanks Liza for um, taking over, I apologize. My Internet just kicked me off and I couldn't reboot it. So um, here, share screen. 
And then poor Liza had to work on the unupdated presentation. <laughs> so I appreciate it, Liza. Let's see, so we're starting here. And everybody can hear me? Good. Yes, yes we can okay. hear you. Okay. Oops, I didn't want to go from beginning. Sorry, after I just did that. So we have, uh, this is Phil. So we have several questions in the chat, but I think we should take the questions at the end. Does that work for you? Um, that's fine with me if you want to do them now. So if there's more clarification, if you want to do them, it doesn't matter to me. So, okay. so Amy, just so you know, we are seeing the full, um, both the slide and the note slide. Okay. Your presenter view screen at the moment. Okay, um, I think it's because I have, let me, um, let me close this down then. Not sure how to, okay, I think it's because I have my other, let me just unplug my mom. We may have lost Amy again. Let me take a look. Hmm. Uh, no, she, I think, is still with us. Uh, might have been just locked up at this point. I'll give it a little, I'll give it a minute or so here. So, Liza, one of the questions was how many, how many J's constitutes a colony? So but, we, we'll, we'll kind of cover that in this section a little bit, I think. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. And so now do you see the regular presentation? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I unplugged something and then I lost you guys again. <laughs> so did you wanna ask any more questions or are we good to just go? Sorry. Yeah, let's just go. Okay. So no, I'm gonna talk about Liza um, was the first one to kind of jump on the Pinion J project. And then I loved Pinion J so much. I said, well, maybe I should take a look at, you know, an intensive survey of the actual colonies. Since you, in her project, she was finding colonies across the state and they were basically just identifying where the colony area was. I wanted to come back and look at several questions as far as what was going on in these Pinion J colonies. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. And now I can't forward my slide. This is just not my evening, I am telling you. Um, is there a way to forward the slides that I'm not doing now? <sighs> okay. Nope. Okay. Just saw your cursor on the screen. What happens if you see the cursor on the screen? Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the first thing I wanted to know was how did they have high site fidelity to colonies? Were they coming back to these areas year after year after year? Did they just use them for a couple years and then leave the area? And so that was kind of one of our first questions. And so like Liza said in the previous slide, we revisited 23 colonies that they had identified in their statewide effort. And we visited these colonies three times throughout the breeding season. Again, like Liza said, it was about February 14th through the end of May. We spent three days at each colony conducting surveys, um, basically just going out and seeing if the Jays were there. And we conducted surveys both in the morning and evening. And we documented breeding behaviors, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end of this um, presentation so that everybody who goes out and does J surveys will um, recognize breeding behaviors. And we also work to locate nests and to classify nests. And I'll clarify that in a minute. So nests, nest classification, um, thinking about nest, nest site fidelity, since we're only looking over a couple of years doing our surveys, if we could look at a colony and look at and find a bunch of different age nests, we would know that that colony had been on the landscape for quite a while. And so through our experience, we found that you could classify nests. You could have these class one, what we classified as class one nests. This one right here where they look very fresh, very new, probably one to three years old. They still have really good lining in the nest. The sticks are still in really great shape. And so, you know, okay, they've been at least nesting here for one to three years. Then we had what we considered a class two nest where the lining doesn't look as clear. The sticks are kind of falling apart. There's a lot of debris in there. And then we gauge those to be about four to six years old. 
And then we got these class three nests, which had no lining left in them. And I don't know if Liza talked to you a little bit about pinion jay nests, but they are, they are diagnostic by having this um, juniper bark lining in them. And so, and because they're early nesters, they really make this thick insulation in their nests. And so that does last for a while, but these class three means that there was just a bunch of sticks, maybe a little club, cup formation, but you know, that test was, that nest was probably greater than six years old. And then you also run into these other nests that are, we called class four, where they would start to build a nest and then they just didn't finish that nest. So we were able to classify nests to assess nest site fidelity. And these are the 23 colonies that we looked at. So we looked at all the way up here in Moffat County, um, all the way down into um, the San Luis Valley, everywhere that we have been able to find a colony. The blue circles are where we saw jays nesting for the entire duration of our survey effort. And the yellow areas are where we found some old nests some sign of previous colony activity, but we just couldn't find any jays in the area. And so um, because of the nests that we found and for the number of years that we found jays nesting in an area, we decided that they had high site fidelity to these nesting colonies, which makes them that even that much more important to protect and to manage because these areas are used year after year by these jays. So our nest findings, we were able to, during our surveys, um, document 281 active nests. That means we found a female incubating, building, having nestlings, fledging young. We had 281 active nests over the two years of our survey efforts. We documented over 1,400 old nests. So any of those nests that were class two, three, or four, we also found those old nests. We did find that nest tree heights varied from about five feet all the way up to 32 feet. The average height was about 13 feet, so not really tall trees. Nest height is usually about six feet, um, so it's usually about eye level or a little bit higher for myself, but it can vary from anywhere from two to 23 feet high is the nest height. We found most of our nests were in juniper trees, and that was both Rocky Mountain, Utah juniper trees, and 25% were found in pinyon pines. And we did map the extent of these colonies <clears throat> and we found that they can be pretty large. So like Liza said, a colony is a pr pretty loose, um, a loose congregation of nests. I think it's more about the flock using an area as that colony because you have the breeders that are in the colony, you have the younger birds that are in the colony and they really do hold tight to that colony area. And I think one of the question was, you know, what is the average number of birds in a colony it varies. Um, I would say that our average is anywhere from about 40 to 70 birds is what we have, but that's not how many breeders you have. That's kind of the, all, the whole flock of the young birds and the breeders. Um, so our colony sizes can get all the way up to 1500 acres if we map the perimeter of all the nests that we found, that's including all the old nests and the active nests. If you only map the active nests in the colonies, then that declines to about 400 acres. So that colony area is moving, you know, annually. It doesn't, it's not just static in the same area year after year. Um, active nests, you can have nests as close as four meters to one another. So you can have nests really close together or they can be as far as like two and a half kilometers away. And you never do, we've never found two nests in a nesting tree. So they're always in separate trees, even if they're very close together. So this is an example of a colony area that we surveyed. Um, and the outline is the perimeter of the colony. The, the little circles were active nests in 2020. And then the pink squares, purple squares were active nests in 2021. So you can see there's some overlap where they were active nesting in 2020 and 2021. And then all the triangles are all those old nests that we found. The yellow ones are um, class two nests. So those ones that are about four to six years old and the green triangles were ones that were about six to 10 years old. So you can see 
that these birds are using this area year after year, so they do have high site fidelity to areas. Our nesting and fledging success, that was the other thing that we measured. So we measured site fidelity. We were looking at the extent of colonies, how big are these areas? And we also wanted to look at nesting and fledging success. Like Liza mentioned, predators can prey on pinion jays as well as pinion jay eggs and nestlings. Um, our number of active nests per colony, like I said, the active number of birds was anywhere from 40 to 70. And our nest, um, the number of nests within a colony varied from one. We had some one colony that just had one nest, if you want to call that a colony, all the way up to 29 nests was the most that we ever found in a colony. The we first female that we ever found incubating was 28th of February. So they started the courtship behaviors on 14th of February, but she didn't actually get on her nest until 28th of February. And then in 2021, when we had more snow, they didn't, we didn't detect birds on the nest until 7th of March. Um, usually the birds are done nesting. Most of the most of the birds have left the flocks towards the end of May, and that was pretty much the same about the 22nd, 24th of May, and 2020 and 2021. Um, as you saw on that map, we did have four colonies that had no active nesting activity, though we did still see birds in the area. So there was still a flock using the area, but they weren't actually breeding. And so we did measure nesting success, oops. And we did find that nesting success for pinion jays was about 64%, which isn't bad for a passerine. It's actually pretty decent, but fledging success was pretty low at about, you know, 19%. So the birds were pretty successful at getting the eggs to hatch, but then fledging success was pretty low. I think nesting success is a lot higher because the female is constantly incubating. And so some, unless someone scares her off the nest, those eggs are pretty well protected. But fledging success, like Liza mentioned, I think in the earlier slides, you know, they brood for you know, up to eight to 10 days, depending on how many nestlings are in the nest, but then they go off with the male to gather food and then come back and feed the nestlings. And when they come back, those nestlings start begging and they're loud. And so once they're fed and those birds leave, you know, a predator can figure out where those birds are. And I do think I saw some a question in the chat, what were the predators of nestlings? Ravens are the biggest predator of um, pinion jay nests. Um, most of our loss of nests were to ravens. If you can't see this as a baby pinion jay being eaten by this raven right here. And they're really savvy. I mean, they watch the pinion jays and they come in and they'll just flap their wings at trees where they know the pinion jays are to kind of get them to jump off. And if those nests are in close proximity, they're very good at knowing this nest, hitting this nest, and then going to the next nest. And they do seem to hang around and they do seem to prefer to eat the nestlings. Um, I don't know, but it's, uh, and the jays will go out and mob them and they'll do everything they can to get them to back away, but the ravens just kind of ignore them and keep doing their business. And you can see pinion jays, they also like to breed at sites where there is human infrastructure and ravens like to nest on power poles and cliffs that are near colony areas. So they kind of overlap with their nesting activity. Other predators that we found are great horned owls. Um, owls like to usually eat the head off a young nestling, so that's kind of how we identified that. You can have other um, jay species um, breaking open eggs and eating the yolks. And then we also had some mammalian predators like ground squirrels that would come in and eat the nest. But this was a much smaller percentage of take by these other predator species on pinion jay chicks. So just wanted to give you an idea of what the nest trees look like. Um, people always ask me, what does a pinion jay nest tree look like? Well, there's a lot of variation in sizes and ages. I think the main thing that you wanna pay attention to is twig density, where they put those nests, they want them to be really well covered and concealed so that they are protected from those predators and they aren't as noticeable um, from animals coming out to find those nests. So these are actually, this area is actually a treatment where the pinion juniper was removed and these are long, uh, young trees coming back. And this was a pinion jay that nested in this nest um, and this nest was actually successful. 
Um, the most common tree I'd say that you find them in are these young, really healthy trees. And you can see why they have these really thick twig density where the jays can put the nest and they're really hard to get into. And the nest can be really hard to find, but that seems to be the most common tree that they use. But they also use these really old mature trees. But again, this nest is in here. Um, it's really well covered from any kind of predators is what they're really seeking out with that twig density. So they can use a lot of variety of different trees. Um, some of the lessons that we've learned about the breeding habitat that they like is maybe counterintuitive than what you think is they do like to use um, kind of open areas, habitats on the edges and the ecotones of this pinyon juniper forest. So they would nest more like in this thicker pinyon juniper, but it's always abutting this kind of grassland or sagebrush area. So you might find some pinyon jays in here. This is one of our colonies, but it's always in this open area. And I did see uh, when I was wait listening to Liza's presentation, I did see a question about do they feed the chicks insects? And yes, I think that they like to be in these open areas because the insect availability is much higher than if you would be in a pinyon juniper forest. And so they are feeding those young nestlings insects more than they're giving them um, pinion nuts. So kind of thinking about a pinion juniper forest and how we think about them, the colonies are more in this phase two, maybe on this edge of phase three. And these are areas that are actually being um, uh, selected for the woodland management. This is mostly the area that they're selecting because it's easier to control. And it is this idea of the pinions or the junipers encroaching into those sagebrush and grasslands. But that seems to be where jays want to breed. And it's one of the reasons that we want to understand breeding habitat better, find ways to protect it, and find ways to better manage it. And so again, just another example, this colony is kind of encompassing this area next to this open grassland. And again, we haven't ever found any pinion jay colonies in this thicker, thicker stuff and at very high elevations. Again, the elevation thing comes to, into play a little bit because at the lower elevations is where you get this, this interplay between the grasslands and shrublands. But like Liza said, we're just learning about jays. We have 23 colonies that we've looked at. We know we have a lot more to learn about them. And so that's where we're coming to you um, as your citizen science project and ways that you might be able to help um, CPW with our efforts because we can't get everywhere and do everything. So it's always great to have a, a really motivated crew. So we're still interested in finding pinion jay colonies. Um, there's some areas that we haven't been able to survey um, and we know there's more out there than the 23 that we've found. Again, we wanna find these colonies because we want to help manage and protect them so that we can inform like that, we develop that survey protocol for the BLM and the United States Forest Service. We also gave them all the maps of our colonies so that they're aware of where they are in the landscape so that if they're planning a woodland treatment, they can avoid those areas. Or we've been to some areas where they're just cutting out little bitty trees in those sagebrush so they maintain that openness for pinion jays, which is beneficial. Um, we'd like to set up a program where we start to monitor all our colonies through time because like we said we have high site fidelity so if we're starting to see some of those colonies not having jays coming to breed then that begs the question why not is it because we're near an area where we're having a huge die-off and so they're foregoing breeding is it because of huge treatments that are being undertaken so we'd like to start a program to start monitoring these these um, populations and these colonies so knowing where a number of um, colonies are is just gonna benefit that information. So um, I think one of the questions for Eliza and I was, you know, where to survey. Um, one area we haven't spent a lot of time in is the Front Range and the Ponderosa Pine Forest. I think Liza mentioned too that, yes, they're usually associated with pinion juniper in Colorado, but we also know um, through the breeding bird atlas that there is a potential breeding colony on the front range in the ponderosa pine and we haven't really been able to do surveys up there mainly because of private land issues and kind of the size of sizes of our grids that we used and they had to be 30 percent public land to be surveyed so we'd love to learn more about you know are there colonies in ponderosa pine on the front range also 
just where New Mexico abuts Colorado, way down south across the whole border where we know New Mexico has really good pinyon jay populations. We haven't done a lot of work down there either. Um, and so that would be great if anybody wanted to take a trip down there. And then Los Alamos Animas County, there's a, a lot of private land, so we haven't been able to survey there either. So those are some of the hot spots that we'd like to get to. Um, remember, there is a lot of private land, so if you're going to do those surveys, don't trespass, you know, meet the landowner or whatever. But those are some of the places that we haven't spent a lot of time looking or haven't even had some surveys completed. Um, after this slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pinion jay behaviors. But what we're looking for is if you if you see any of these behaviors that we describe in there, it's between the dates of about mid-February to the end of May, you know, email Liza and I, and we'll go out there or we'll have a biologist go out there and see if there's a colony. Because it does take a long time to find a colony and follow the birds to um, determine it. And so um, if you find that, we'd like to go out and just follow behind to see if there is a colony. Um, just a, there was a little bit of a quest to talk about a pinion jay appearance. Since you guys will be out there doing surveys, we've had plenty of pictures um, about pinion jays throughout this, but definitely a diagnostic is that sharp pointed bill that they use to dig into those cones. They're entirely blue, except for that white um, chin that they have. Immatures, you'll see a flock and the immature birds are usually um, lighter blue, kind of a grayish color compared to the adults. Some people say you can tell males and females apart just because the male has a little bit more blue in the head, but with the sun and how you see them, I, I can't tell them apart and I don't know. I wouldn't recommend really trying to do it unless you had them in hand. And they also have a shorter tail as compared to other J species. And I would say the biggest confusion species that you might have is a Woodhouse's um, scrub jay. And one telltale sign, I always tell them different, is when there's a bird perched on a tree, the woodhouses always drops off really quickly and then flies, whereas the jay just kind of takes off directly. And that's a real, you know, if you're kind of from a distance, is that a pinion jay or a scrub jay? It's a pretty easy way to determine the two different species. Um, I really, Liza and I really wanted to play all these vocalizations for you so you could kind of hear what you're going to hear when you're out there doing J surveys, but we can't, the audio just doesn't work. But if you go to this website, All About Birds, there is like a list of calls and they said, you guys said you were going to um, record this. So I just wrote down the number one, two, the third call isn't really a, a common one, so I didn't write it down, but I wrote down what you would be hearing from the typical caw call, which is the first one, to the rack of call, which means, oh my gosh, they know I'm here, there's danger, um, all the way down to the begging call by a female or a young jay. So just listen to those. If you have any questions, contact Liza and I, but those are the most common ones you'll hear at a pinion jay um, colony area. If you ever get to hear these little trills with two pairs talking to each other, it's just really, it's just really special. It's special because it's just like they just communicate and they're trying to pick out a nest and it's just really fun to hear. So this is a very busy slide and I can send out like a PDF of these behaviors, but these are the things that we would like you to look for. And if you see them, report them. Um, and I don't know if you, you want to go over them tonight or if you want to read through them, um, but it's a lot of information. They do do a lot of courtship behaviors. Most of the courtship behaviors are in that late February, early March. And then they, a lot of the birds will start sitting on the nests. So it's like everybody gets busy doing their courtship and then the birds go and make a nest and then they sit on the nest. And then when they're on the nests, it gets really quiet for about an hour, an hour and a half. And then birds will come in and females will pop off their nests and they'll beg, 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 beg to get fed by a male and then they'll get back on the nest. And then kind of the tail end of breeding is when you have some nestlings. So you can come when they have nestlings and it's kind of the same thing, the birds will come in and you can hear the nestlings in the tree being fed. And then finally the fledglings fledge and then they'll just get really, really noisy. 
And that's why I think they leave the colony relatively quickly because they draw a lot of attention because they're very noisy. And when there's fledglings, there are a ton of young birds guarding the colony and they'll really come at you. So you know that you're near some fledglings. But these are all breeding behaviors. Um, and so if you notice these, we'd like to hear about them. If you do hear birds begging at a nest or see a female, or if you hear nestlings and fledglings, we'd also like to hear about that as well. And then we'll definitely get on, get in the car and go look to see if it's a colony for sure. Because most of this, all this behavior that I'm describing, we we're, we've always found that we're in a colony when this happens. We're not like, they're two miles away and then they're gonna to go to a colony. So it's a really good indication you're in a breeding area. And then just if you do see breeding birds, make sure it's a pinion jay. The one way to tell from a scrub jay is she'll usually have this white eyebrow because their nests can look pretty similar and they can look pretty similar when they're in the tree. And then you'll usually see a little bit of gray on her back. So take a look at that if you ever do see a, a, a bird on a nest. Cause these scrub jays I found on my colonies they nest about a month later, so you can run into them. This is just two examples of a pinion jay with nest with eggs. So the eggs look quite a bit different. This is a scrub jay nest. Um, and you can see in the scrub jay nest, there's no juniper bark, and that's kind of a tell uh, the diagnostic characteristic for a pinion jay nest. So you can see the pinion juniper bark on this nest. Doesn't always have to be a lot, but there has to be a couple of pieces. Pin, scrub jay nests seem to be more, they like the grass to weave the grass in there. So Amy, I just wanted to check in and say how, because we also have a lot of questions that have been asked. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm about okay, done. Great. Yeah, and then just the other species that nests commonly with pinion jays is the Clark's nutcracker. Pretty distinct, but you'll see them nesting with pinion jays and sometimes they get into ruckus, ruckus nests with each other. This is just, um, our acknowledgments for people that have helped us and then we'll go to questions, so yeah. Great, thanks. So you can see the chat, right? Also, the questions asked there. Um, I can pull it up right now. I'll stop sharing. And um, before we even dive into that, I wanna to go to one question in particular from Beverly Compton. She said, is this uh, slideshow available to download? It has important educational information that I'd like to share with my volunteers. And if so, we could also put it on the CFO Pinion J Community Science Project um, page. Um, yeah, I mean, we can, this presentation, we could share it as a PDF if that works. Is that, is that what you'd like to do? I, you know, yeah, you, uh, whatever would work best for you all, you know, either a PDF or as, you know, a PowerPoint slideshow. And, you know, we could certainly talk about that and see what's available. And then for anybody listening, um, we'll push out a um, email if we have any content that we could then share with you all. Yeah, I so, mean, I um, think PDF's easiest just because we could probably email it, so. Okay, sounds great. great. Sounds great. And Phil, I'll go ahead and let you go from here. <laughs> okay, great. So I, I guess the, the first question I have is that we also have the Community Science Project with Great Basin. So if people are signed up for Great Basin, when they also see uh, a nesting colony, they should also contact you. So yeah, so you asked if they, if they think they've seen breeding behaviors or they have any indication that nesting is going on or even see a bird on the nest, then yes, please contact Liza and I so that we could go out and confirm it and just put it on our, our records or in our maps. Great. That's, okay. kind of, that's, that's kind of what our interest is right now is finding colonies. The, the birds are so, they're hard to survey at other times of year because they're so mobile and it's hard to pin them down. Okay, great. Well, I'll let you go through. Can I let you go through the questions or do you want me to go through them? Me and Liza? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Amy, I was just going to follow up on, um, you know, we definitely are interested in finding in the breeding colonies. And one of the reasons we'd like you to contact us is because we also have found that they, you know, they can abandon nests. So we just often will try not to do a lot of surveying in within the breeding colony while they're there breeding. 
And so that protocol I mentioned, the BLM and the um, Forest Service, we actually, you know, we'll go back and survey after and look for nests and um, after the breeding is done, because we're not recommending that people do a lot of traipsing around through a colony while they're there breeding. Yeah, and that's a good point, Liza, because the ravens can key in on you really quickly. And like she, like Liza said, we found if you get them in the breeding, I mean, in the building stage, like we never go on a nest when they're building. We sit back and just wait on a ridge top and watch. Um, they'll abandon nests. So yeah, we just, if you can just record a behavior and then get out of there, that's the safest thing for the birds, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess the first question is, can you elaborate on the naked nostrils versus the other type of nostrils? It's based, so Gymnorias, which is um, the species name is basically refers to a naked nostril. And so it's just that they don't have feathers in that picture that was with that um, description. They don't have feathers on, on their nares. And that's because they poke their, their bills into these green cones to get at the nuts. And so they get a lot of sap. And so it just keeps that, that clean. Mm -hmm. So, okay, great. So if the, if the J's, J's decrease, will the pines still be able to distribute and germinate adequately? I think that, I mean, we don't know what would happen there. Um, I mean, we know that, yeah, I mean, that's an unknown question. Um, they've been a great species to distribute the seeds and with there being absence, I don't know what would happen. That's I, something I couldn't address. Liza, you have any thoughts? Maybe another species will step in or maybe there's things that we don't know about how they get distributed and germinate other than pinion jays. Um, but mm -hmm. there's there's a lot we don't even know about pinion juniper woodlands. It's actually one of the ones we know the least amount about. Yeah. Good question though. <laughs> okay, so I'm not, not sure what that question means. Where's the question? I was trying to read it. Uh, oh, here it is. Okay. How does their diet play into their super early breeding phenology, if at all? Um, they, well, a lot of, so the, a lot of their effort is to gather those seeds and fall, like Liza talked about, and then they cache it. And so when they're, and that allows them to breed early because they have that food source, it's cached, they can sit on the nest and then that food source is available. Um, some of the thought, I mean, there is an, and then some of the thought is then when the nestlings are off the nest, it's at a prime time when insects are coming out in the pinion juniper woodlands. And if you've been, spent a lot of time in the pinion juniper woodlands, when you start getting into May and June, it gets really hot. And so um, they start early to, because they can with the caching food, then they can, access those good insects early in the season when they start to hatch and then they're done nesting by the time it gets too hot is is kind of what I've seen with pinion jays and how that their nesting cycle works. Great. Yeah, because by the end of the season, I'm so hot, I don't even want to go look for them anymore. <laughs> okay, next question is, uh, do you have any idea what vital rates um, might be contributing the most to their decline? So which one of the conditions might be contributing the most to the pinion jay decline? Um, well, I mean, from our work, it looks like that their, their reproductive output is like the fledging. I mean, the nestlings aren't getting old enough to fledge. I, and then, And then we know from other research that's been done that um, fledglings have very low survival and then juveniles have even lower survival. So it's just that we're not being able to um, have a, a bird that can replace itself basically because the reproductive output doesn't look sufficient, at least in some of the models that we've run for the nest success and the fledgling success that we've had. Um, I don't know, there has been some study about survival rates of the adults um, that was that were done, you know, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. So 
Um, I think my concern is mainly that we're just not getting good enough reproduction to replace it. And then if we start getting birds that just could forego nesting, then that's, we're just not replacing the adults. Great, great. Thanks Liza, do you have any thoughts on that? Next question is, are young fed pine nuts or do they eat insects? They mainly eat insects when they're young, the nestlings. Uh, do they cache black, black oil sunflower seeds? Yes, I think they do. They like to go to feeders and then they'll come back to their cache sites and cache them. Oh, they, but I don't they, know they, how, I don't know how long, I don't know how well those seeds last cache, but I don't know how well pinion seeds cat last. Mm -hmm. I think the next question you answered, what animals prey on pinion jays, ex, uh, especially close to, to increasing human population areas? I mean, yeah. You mentioned the ravens. Ravens, great horn owls like human populations. Um, some other research has found cats will even get them. Um, mm -hmm. So. Great. Um, um, there's a lot of comments in here. I'm just looking for the questions. Uh, the one was how many jays are considered a colony? And you said it could be just, I guess, two, or I guess one. <laughs> well, that's a nest. We found one nest. There was more than two birds there. Um, so, but only one, one pair decided to nest out of that flock, it seemed like. <laughs> Um, uh, the environment for the Americas asked, what can we do to help as a non-specialist? I think you answered that question about letting them know about the nest area, don't go into the nest area, but call you all because you don't want to disturb anything. Um, one question is, uh, is there data for 2022 as well? I don't know you showed 2022. Data. No, we haven't done any. I had to, we didn't do any work in 2022. Okay, great. That, that, you know, I'm, I didn't. I'm just kind of going through these to make sure we get to everyone's question. Um, wow. Uh, is the extent of cooperation breeding impacted by any of the environmental environmental conditions? Fewer breeders during drought, or some more helpers help some more helper birds, I guess. I'm not quite sure I got that question right. Is the extent? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I don't, I was trying to find it. Um. Yeah, yeah, I think um, like Amy mentioned, if in really in drought years, they will forego, forego breeding. So we will not have as many breeding birds and but they'll still be in flocks. Um, and so potentially more helper birds, but you'll still get the flocks, but you just may not have the breeders as many breeding birds or nests. Great. So a lot of people are talking about where they see the birds in their area, which is great. Um, you know, like La Vida, they have 30 pinion jays coming to their feeders all the time. That's a lot of feeder. Okay. High altitude in winter. High high altitude in winter. They are very poofy. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> okay, here's one. Um, beyond the community science initiative, does the working group? have plans for future field research in Colorado or elsewhere in Pinion Range? Um, there's a, currently there's a graduate student working um, in the Roaring Fork, not the Roaring Fork, I'm only thinking. The Royal Gorge. Royal Gorge, thank you. Um, BLM office to investigate um, Pinion Jays and potentially the impacts of woodland treatment on pinion jays and that's project is starting this year mm -hmm. and then and cpw oh go ahead liza well i was going to say and in utah um uh the working group like scott summershoe and utah they have a phd project that's 
going to be also looking at trying to assess the impacts of pinyon juniper woodland treatments on pinyon jays. So there is an effort to look at impacts from treatment on pinyon jays. So how far do birds range after breeding? They can, we don't really know, we don't really know for sure. Um, there's some, yeah, we don't really know for sure after breeding how far they range in Colorado. <laughs> oh, so this is interesting. Uh, within flocks, does each bird cache individually or do they share caches? Seems like birds would notice where uh, others caches and steal the seeds. Yeah, so they go they go as a flock together and go to a site and can cache. But I've also seen a single bird, like under a tree, digging up seeds. So, but yeah, a lot of times it'll be a cache where a whole flock will cache seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a good one. Has anyone used ARUs to? Also, my page shifted on me. Uh, detect breeding. Wait. I have. I don't know that we've done that yet, but we're going to do it this year with that graduate student. Okay. Yeah. Has anyone used ARUs to detect flock behavior? Great. Uh, there's one asking us to repeat the flying behavior, behavior differences, but we're going to send that out, right, in a PDF. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was answered again below too. Uh -huh. In the chat. Okay, great. Yeah, it's hard to follow it all. Uh, uh, one is uh, could anyone could could you explain what you mean by treatment? Is that fire mitigation or uh, different habitat manipulation? I think you answered that a little bit, but maybe to be a little clearer. Um, we're, we it can, it could be a number of treatments, woodland treatments for fuels reduction. It could be treatments for other species like sage grouse and big game treatments. Um, so it could be a number of different things and they all have a little bit different priorities. So there's just a lot of manipulation going on in the pinyon juniper woodland. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have anything else to add, Liza? No, that's good. Well, I think I covered all the q and I'm not sure, but I think I, anything anybody asked. So um, I guess I would ask the, the group, are there any other questions for Amy and Liza? And while, while we're waiting, Amy and Liza, thank you so much for this presentation hanging in there with the uh, technical difficulties and everything. It, it, as, some, as somebody just said, this really was an informative presentation. Yeah, it was It was very good. So I, I really, at the start, I said, I'm expecting to learn a lot. <laughs> and I learned a lot. It really uh, enhanced my knowledge of pinion jays. And I got a, a great understanding for all the work you're doing with um, at CPW. And so that's very good to know where, where all this research is going. So this is just great. Oh, somebody raised their hand just recently. What and I that? saw a question that I thought was interesting and it said, there may be an urge to increase feeding pinion jays at home feeders. Is there a downside to feeder feeding? Is there a time in the season at which one would stop feeding birds at home feeders? And that's always, I think bird feeders are always a complex question. Um, and I, I'm just gonna talk about an observation I had. So it's always hard to know if it's good or bad, um, artificial feeding, but the, the flock that Liza and I found of 800 birds, they were regularly feeding at a feeder and that flock has never been as big over, and I, that flock I've watched over the last four years because it's right next to my house. And they were regularly going to this amazing feeder and the individual stopped feeding them so um, it, supplementally feeding them could increase the number of birds or their ability to cache seeds and breed, especially in times when there is die-off of pinion nuts. But um, that's a hard question. I don't know if Liza, you 
deal a lot more with feeding. We do the, I deal with rosy finches too, and people want to feed rosy finches a lot. Um, and it's a hard question to answer. I don't know, Liza, if you have other thoughts. No, I agree. It is a, it's a hard question to answer. There's probably some times when it may be beneficial and then other times when it's probably not necessary for pinion jays, depending on the, the type of year. And like, um, I do think when food sources are scores, so scarce, then they will roam much more widely and go to a lot of, um, you know, looking for feed so sources. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, well, folks, it's 8.15. And um, I think at this point, we can uh, say thank you both once again to Liza and and Amy and Phil, thank you so much for hosting this. And for everybody um, who attended and you, you know, your thoughtful questions. And uh, as soon as I get the PDF, I, I will let all of you know. So you can use that as a resource. And um, Amy or Eliza, any last thoughts? Just thank you for inviting us and let us share what we've learned about this amazing species. And I'll just warn you, you start doing pinion days, you'll get addicted. They are so <laughs> much fun to work with. So just be prepared. And I will um, convert this uh, presentation into a PDF. And then I do you want me just to email it to you, Phil? And Yeah, into Linda. Okay. That, that's great. Okay. Okay. But thank you so much for having us and have fun looking for Jays. And I hope you find a lot. Yeah, thank thanks your, everybody. Thanks for all your efforts and thank you all for all of you who attended. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks everybody. Good night.